Greetings to all lovers of tales, myths, and legends. Dionysus is a god accompanied by a merry retinue of menads and satyrs. Forever joyful and intoxicated to madness, he is the god of wine, viticulture, and other vegetation. Incredible natural energy emanates from him. It is alluring yet dark, casting off shackles and inspiring you. On one hand, it is beautiful, but on the other. So, who is Dionysus? Today, we will try to figure that out. And for those who find one video about Greek mythology insufficient, I recommend visiting the channel. Cadmus, the founder of Thebes, the main city of Boeotia, had a daughter named Semele, so beautiful that Zeus himself fell in love with her. Under the cover of night, he would take on the appearance of a human and enter the chambers of the Theban princess. For a while, no one knew about this affair, neither mortals nor gods. However, the secret was revealed, and word of the infidelity reached Zeus' jealous wife, Hera. In her anger, the goddess decides to destroy Semele. To do so, she assumes the form of Barrow, the nurse who had raised the girl. When someone knocks on Semele's door late in the evening, she thinks it is Zeus and, elated with love, immediately opens it. Standing at the threshold is Barrow. The girl is surprised by the nurse's late arrival, as she has long been living outside of Thebes. Surprise soon gives way to joy because Semele loves her old nanny. She immediately shares with her all the joys and troubles happening to her. Thus, she accidentally reveals the secret about Zeus, who comes to her in the form of a beautiful youth. The old woman smiled with an unkind smile and said, Are you sure it is Zeus and not some scoundrel? The seed of doubt immediately bore fruit. The girl did not know how to respond. However, cunning Heron noticed her confusion and started instigating. You must test him. When he comes next time, ask him to swear to fulfill any of your wishes. And then demand that he reveal his true form. Having given this advice, Hera in the disguise of the nurse hurriedly departed, leaving Semele to contemplate the situation in solitude. The door was knocked once again, and this time, the girl did not rush to open it. When she saw her beloved at the doorstep, she immediately frowned with offense. Why are you so sad? Zeus asked. Is something bothering you? Just tell me. Semele, turning her back to the young man, said. If you are the mighty Zeus, swear to fulfill my wish. He swore by the waters of the Styx, and the girl continued. I want to see you in all your glory, just as Hera sees you. Zeus, in perplexity, knowing how this would end, refused the beloved, but Semele insisted. The beautiful youth standing before her disappeared. The sky outside became covered in clouds, thunder resounded, a hurricane arose, breaking the branches of trees and carrying them away. Before Semele, Zeus appears engulfed in flames, in all his glory. She falls at his feet and crumbles into dust. The fire engulfs Semele's chambers, and in the place where she stood, a beautiful infant, Dionysus, appears. The fire does not touch him. Zeus takes the baby in his arms and disappears. Thus, Dionysus is born for the first time. Zeus saves his child, but the baby is too weak to live. If Hera were to discover him, she would swiftly deal with him. Swift-footed Hermes comes to the rescue. He opens his father's thigh and sews the baby inside. Thus, Dionysus grows stronger within Zeus' body, and after three months, Hermes opens Zeus' thigh again, and the infant is born for the second time. Agreeably, it is a highly unusual birth, even for Greek mythology. But what happened afterward is even more interesting. Dionysus had a long journey ahead of him before ascending to Olympus. Zeus decides to entrust his son to the care of Semele's sister, Eno, and her husband, Athamas. They dress Dionysus in women's clothing to conceal him from Hera. The story of Eno and Athamas deserves a separate examination, but it cannot fit within the format of this video. 
So, in short, at first, Athamas was married to Nephili, created in the image and likeness of Hera, but then he falls in love with Eno. For those who like to say that everything was not as such, I will mention that there is another version of this myth. If you want to hear both versions, please write about it in the comments. Hera, furious with Athamas' infidelity, discovers their hidden illegitimate child of Zeus and unleashes madness upon them. Under the spells of Hera, Athamas kills and tears apart his own son, Lurkos, thinking he is a white stag. Perhaps Dionysus would have suffered a similar fate if it weren't for Hermes, who manages to rescue the child from the clutches of the deranged couple. He temporarily transforms him into a young goat and entrusts him to the care of the nymphs Macri, Nis, Arito, Bromi, and Baksh, who reside on Mount Helican, specifically on Mount Nyssa. In their company, Dionysus grows up. They settle him in caves, feed, nurture, and raise him on honey. It is on Mount Nyssa, according to legends, that Dionysus invents wine. One day, the young Dionysus sees a snake biting a cluster of grapes. He takes the cluster in his hands and squeezes it, observing the liquid that flows out. It is then that the idea comes to his mind to cultivate grapes and make wine from them. Finally, Dionysus becomes an adult, and despite the femininity imposed on him during his upbringing, Hera recognizes him as Zeus' son. His story greatly annoys her, and she sends madness upon him. Dionysus leaves Mount Nyssa. His companion and mentor becomes Silenus, the wise prophet who knows all about the nature of things and people. However, he is not fond of sharing his knowledge, at least not with a clear mind. Fortunately, he remains sober exceptionally rarely. One day, Silenus disappeared completely. When a forest stump tripped the donkey he was riding, Silenus fell off and remained lying in the roadside bushes. No one noticed, and Silenus calmly slept where he fell. In the morning, the servants of King Midas found him and brought him to the palace. The king immediately recognized who stood before him and surrounded him with all honors, allowing him to rest and then assisting him in returning to Dionysus. For this, the god offered Midas to ask for any reward. Not particularly intelligent or imaginative, Midas asked that everything he touched turn to gold. I'm sorry, Midas, that you didn't come up with anything better, but so be it. With these words, Dionysus released Midas and sent him home. What happened next, many of you probably know. In addition to Silenus, Dionysus was accompanied by Menads, cheerful half-naked women, and satyrs, hairy and pot-bellied creatures whose legends were filled with tales of lust. They were all armed with swords, snakes, and thyrsi, for those who don't know, they are staffs wrapped in ivy with a pine cone at the top. The semi-drunk army sets off for Egypt, where they are warmly welcomed by King Proteus on the island of Pharos. In gratitude for his hospitality, Dionysus imparts the secret of winemaking. It is on Pharos that Dionysus unites with the Amazons from the Nile Delta and achieves his first military victory over the Titans, simultaneously restoring the exiled King Ammon to his throne. But he doesn't intend to rest on his laurels. Dionysus' path lies eastward to India. The first obstacle in his way is the Euphrates River. To cross it, he builds a bridge of ivy and grapevines. However, on the other side awaits the army of King Damascus. But the crowd of Menads and Satyrs defeats them, and the king meets a gruesome death as his skin is torn from his body while he is still alive. On the journey to India, entire countries are conquered by the god of wine. He builds cities, gives them laws, and, of course, teaches the art of viticulture. The return journey is not without resistance either. Dionysus is attacked by hordes of Amazons, who are soon turned to flee and pursued by an unusual army all the way to Ephesus. Few of them survive, taking refuge in the temple of Artemis. After the campaign, Dionysus heads to Phrygia, where Rhea, his grandmother, cleanses him of madness and grants forgiveness for all the killings committed during this time. But Dionysus' campaign is only just beginning as he sets off for Thrace. 
However, his fame precedes him, and news of the effeminate youth who considers himself a god reaches the Thracian king Lycurgus. He is clearly not pleased with such a guest and his lascivious entourage. Moreover, it is said that as soon as Dionysus enters the city, all the women are overcome with desire and passion. They are drawn to satyrs and menads and engage in a wild, debaucherous dance. Therefore, as soon as Dionysus lands on the shores at the mouth of the Strymon River, King Lycurgus' army captures everyone except Dionysus, who, evading pursuit, is forced to throw himself off a cliff into the sea. Humiliated and insulted, he finds refuge in the cave of the sea nymph Thetis. Rhea is displeased with her grandson's failure and decides to help him. She releases all the menads and satyrs, while Lycurgus is driven insane. In a fit of madness, he takes an axe and strikes his own son, Dryas. In his delusion, Lycurgus believes he is chopping down a grapevine. And the entire Thracian land becomes barren, horrified by such a wicked act. When Dionysus, emerging from the sea, declares that the land will not bear fruit until Lycurgus is put to death, the people of Thrace take the king to Mount Pangium, where wild horses take his life. No one in Thrace opposes Dionysus any longer, and he continues his journey, heading back to his homeland in Boeotia. In Orchomenus, there were three daughters of Minias named Alsipho, Lusip, and Arsip, who refused to participate in the backcheek processions. They were unaware that Dionysus himself, disguised as a beautiful girl, had invited them. The god of wine did not accept their refusal and decided to punish the women by driving them insane. Eventually, they ended up participating in the procession. When it came time to choose a sacrifice in honor of Dionysus, the lot fell on the son of Lucip, Hippas. His mother and aunts attacked him. After the celebration, the frenzied women danced through the mountains until Dionysus transformed them into bats. Meanwhile, in Thebes, a virtuous king named Pentheus ruled, a man of integrity who abhorred debauchery. When Dionysus stormed into the city with a crowd of half-naked menads and lustful satyrs, Pentheus was shaken. He couldn't fathom that women could engage in such behavior. In his view, they should stay at home and raise children, not roam the streets naked, dancing and reveling. In short, Pentheus did not appreciate Dionysus' arrival in Thebes. However, Dionysus, considering Thebes his homeland, gathered all the people in the square and told them who he was and how he was born. He claimed that his father was Zeus, and he himself was a god. But the people, led by Pentheus, mocked him. Dionysus' aunt, Agave, never believed that her sister, Semele, could seduce Zeus. She spread rumors that Semele had fabricated the story to hide the true identity of her child's father. As a punishment, Zeus struck her down with lightning. Dionysus once again had to flee amidst a hail of arrows and stones, being expelled from his own city, which hurt him even more than the incident in Thrace. This time, his refuge became the forests on Mount Scythiaran. However, he didn't stay there for long. As twilight fell, he gathered his entire retinue and, amidst the noise of rattles, the laughter of menads, and the cries of satyrs, descended upon Thebes. All the Theban women seemed to be intoxicated. They shed their clothes, leaving their homes in such a state, and took to the streets, abandoning their weeping husbands and children. They gathered in the square from which they had expelled Dionysus during the day. In a state of ecstasy and madness, they paid homage to the new god. He watched them with a mischievous smile, applauded them, and invited them to Mount Scythiaran, which he called the Territory of Freedom. It was there that they could drink wine, engage in love orgies, sing, and revel. In this way, he led all the women away from Thebes. The next morning, a priest arrived to inform Pentheus about the events of the night. The Theban king couldn't believe his ears and wanted to see for himself what was truly happening on Mount Scythiaran. The priest warned him that it was dangerous, but it was all just a ruse because he was none other than Dionysus himself. Pentheus remained resolute, determined to go. The priest suggested that, for safety, he should disguise himself in women's clothing. 
The idea seemed reasonable to the Theban king. He let down his hair, arched his eyebrows, and followed the priest in female attire. By evening, they reached their destination. Fires could be seen behind the trees, and the sounds of moans and drunken laughter could be heard. Pentheus' companion abandoned him, and the king decided to approach closer. Deep down, he felt desire and passion, wanting to partake in the madness, but he didn't dare admit it. And so, in an excited state, he timidly approached the fires, but the intoxicated women uncovered his disguise and pounced on him. The most terrifying part was that among them was Pentheus' own mother, Agave. No matter how much he pleaded with her, she did not recognize him. The women got rid of Pentheus in the most horrible way possible. The Bacchanalia continued unabated as if nothing had happened. However, the morning after the terrible hangover, the women sobered up and returned home. Dionysus awaited them in Thebes. He met them and spoke as follows. People, you live within the familiar boundaries that you find comfortable, which is good in one way. But you confine yourselves so much within them that you are afraid to look beyond, afraid to accept yourselves and your dark side. If you don't do that, someday you will perish just like Pentheus did. Embrace the darkness as a part of yourselves, don't pretend it doesn't exist within you. Instead, tame it and make it your own. Don't fear the new and don't fall into extremes, listen to the voice of reason. But don't forget that the new is unfamiliar, alien, and initially incomprehensible, yet it holds the key to freedom. In this way, Dionysus was acknowledged as a god, the son of Zeus, not only by the people of Thebes but by all of Greece. The fate of the wanderer, which he had chosen, did not leave him in peace, and Dionysus continued his travels through the Aegean islands on a ship. In Icaria, it was discovered that the ship was rotten, and it was dangerous to sail further on it. The unwavering god hired another ship with Tyrrhenian sailors bound for Naxos. During the voyage, it became apparent that the ship was actually pirate-owned and headed for Asia. There, the pirate slave traders planned to sell Dionysus, whom they had captured, into slavery, unaware of his divine nature. Suddenly, grapevines started growing from the ship's deck, entwining the mast. The ship's rigging was covered in ivy, oars turned into snakes, and Dionysus himself transformed into a lion. Flutes echoed from the ship's holds. The pirates, not understanding what was happening, or frightened, jumped overboard, and turned into dolphins. In the end, Dionysus did reach Naxos, where he encountered a lovely weeping maiden, Ariadne, whom her lover Theseus had recently abandoned. Touched by her grief and captivated by her beauty, Dionysus promptly married her, a mortal, and then brought her, along with himself, to Olympus. From Naxos, Dionysus journeyed to Argos, ruled by Perseus. At first, Perseus did not want to allow debauched revelries on his land and killed many of the participants, banishing others. In response to such hospitality, Dionysus inflicted madness upon the women of Argos, causing them to devour their own infants alive. Perseus realized his mistake and, to atone for his guilt, erected a temple in honor of Dionysus. And thus, the wanderings of the god of wine came to an end. He ascended to the heavens to take his rightful place at the right hand of his mighty father Zeus, as one of the great gods. It seemed that Dionysus had achieved what he desired, but he had one more journey remaining, to the realm of Hades. There, he bribed Persephone by offering her a myrtle in exchange for permission to take his deceased mother, Semele, with him. His mother ascended with him to the temple of Artemis in treason, but to prevent other spirits of the deceased from becoming envious and causing harm, he changed her name and presented her to the Olympian gods as thy one. Zeus granted her a dwelling, and Hera, concealing her anger, remained silent. As you probably know, Greek myths have multiple variations. The myths about Dionysus are no exception. At the very beginning, I mentioned that Dionysus was born twice, but there is another perspective. Dionysus, the thrice-born god, the first time, Zagreus, Dionysus, was born from Zeus and Persephone. 
The Thunderer visited Persephone in the form of a snake. According to another version, he took on the appearance of Hades. Hera unleashed the Titans upon Zagreus, and they tore him apart when he transformed into a bull. Zeus incinerated the Titans with lightning bolts, and from their ashes, humankind emerged. Athena saved Dionysus' heart and handed it to Zeus. He swallowed it. As for the other two births, I explained them at the beginning. And with that, we'll conclude. If you enjoyed this video, please support it with likes and comments. There are other videos on Greek mythology and more on the channel. Subscribe not to miss anything. See you in the next videos.